There we go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deanne Mazaki. I'm the state representative for the 47th district, House District, which covers Elmhurst, Oak Brook, Oak Brook Terrace, Hinsdale, Clarendon Hills, Westmont, and uh, some other areas in DuPage County, and a little bit of Cook County. Um, we're here today to talk about property taxes. And it's no secret that crippling property taxes have been a major problem for years in the state of Illinois. Illinois' convoluted and broken property tax system has been driving the high cost of living that's pushing families and businesses out of our state. Despite the fact that homeowners have been crying desperately for relief, Democrats last year failed to produce any significant action. What did we get? We got another task force. Now, Republicans took that task force seriously. We wanted to actually see and bring some real reform and relief to the state of Illinois. But rather than using the Property Tax Relief Task Force as a serious opportunity to offer substantive relief to taxpayers, the Democrats deliberately used it and hijacked it to press for the further expansion of other taxes, particularly the income tax. I wish I could say I was surprised, but frankly, the Democrats' approach to that task force was a farce from the very beginning. And despite House Republican efforts to bring forth several of their ideas on property tax relief, our ideas were summarily dismissed by the Democrats who controlled the task force. What were some of those ideas? Pension reform so that future employees could free up money for education. That would, really, that would decrease the reliance on property taxes. We wanted greater reforms to local government pension systems because our municipalities, when you look at some of the property tax levies, the pension levy outweighs the actual annual operational costs that the municipality has. Enhance transparency on property tax bills, including, including informing taxpayers of a lot of key drivers of their tax bills that you don't necessarily think about, so things like the cost of litigation, workers' compensation, insurance, etc. Expanded property tax relief for seniors, including a possible way to exempt them from future increases in school district levies, as well as an expanded assessment freeze. So, here we sit, March 3rd, 2020, two months after the task force deadline, and still we've seen no substantive action taken by the House Democrats. Taxpayers in Cook County, they've already had to pay their property tax bills. Taxpayers in other counties across the state, they're going to be paying their bills. Again, increased bills, while another Democrat-led blue ribbon task force has failed to deliver. We can no longer continue to sit back and wait. The House Democrats continue to not take action. The House Republicans did. We filed a whole basket of bills that are designed to target exactly what people need and to try to make the property tax system more fair. And we call on the House Democrats and the, our, uh, and the Democrats in the Senate <laughs> to actually start calling these bills because we need to start moving this legislation so we can deliver some real relief to taxpayers. One piece of legislation aims to protect struggling homeowners who are on a fixed income, as I previously mentioned. House Bill 5293 creates a real senior citizen's homestead school levy tax exemption. And that's going to tackle the largest part of the property tax bill that seniors see, and that is the one that is forcing lifelong residents out of the home that they've owned for decades. This bill, like so many other proposals filed by the Republicans, it's sitting in the rules graveyard. It needs to be given the fair hearing that it deserves so we can finally provide some property tax relief and comprehensive relief that our homeowners need. At this point, I'd like to turn the mic over to Dan Ugasti, 65th House District. Morning. Thank you, everyone. Dan Ugasti, I'm representative of the uh, 65th District, which is central and northern Kane County, as well as southern McHenry County. I will tell you that when I'm in my district and talking to people, there's not a person within this that district that does not believe taxes are too high within the state of Illinois. And as far as property owners are concerned, property taxes are way too high. That's their number one priority. And this is a problem not just because our voters are telling us it's a problem. We see it in the uh, census information we are receiving. We have a decreasing population. And the reason people tell me they're leaving my district is because property taxes are too high. And when I talk to businesses who are considering moving across state lines, that they're looking to save money. They tell me one of the main reasons is property taxes. Last year, in exchange for an amendment to go from a flat tax rate to a graduated tax rate, a property tax relief task force was put in place. You've heard about it. Representative Mizaki has already mentioned it. 
There were many problems with it, including the fact that it called for an increased sales tax in, in increases in sales tax in order to solve the property tax problem. Nothing came of it. It's not what the people of Illinois wanted to hear. They want to hear about tax relief, and they want to hear about it now. House Bill 4143, the representative Mizaki filed, in which I am a, a co-sponsor, will help school districts get out from under unfunded mandates that are put on, it, put on them by the state. Over the past uh, several years, six per year have gone down onto our school districts. Local governments can't create cost savings and lower taxes when we keep passing these bills. HB 4143 is a step forward in providing real relief to our taxpayers. I also filed six other bills in addition to some of the ones Representative Mizaki mentioned. On the bills I have filed, nothing's yet moved, and we've yet to hear of anything about to move. I'm asking my Democrat colleagues on the other side of the aisle to join me and my fellow Republicans in moving these bills forward. We are a state with problems, and, and not doing anything is not going to be an answer to our problems. Our taxpayers need property tax relief, and we're asking them to join us in, in helping achieve that. Thank you. Representative Brady will speak now. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Representative Dan Brady of the 105th Legislative District. And I, too, want to join my uh, colleagues in their comments uh, and thank them uh, for all their hard work as a member of the Property Tax Relief Task Force myself. Since 1978, I believe it is, there's been nine task force that have been proposed by the majority party, and nine of those task force has not produced anything tangible for the people of Illinois. The most recent task force we've gone through has been uh, alluded to here is the facade that it was. Uh, but we were still at the table as Republicans, and we met, and we attended those meetings throughout the summer and into the, uh, into the fall. Um, legislation that the representatives have both indicated that has been proposed by House Republicans is, is tangible legislation that can really do something. So all we have to do is have a fair hearing. All we have to do is have the ability as representatives in the minority party to have our voice be heard on the behalf of the constituents that not only we represent, but many of us represent all across the state of Illinois. Across the side of the aisle, it shouldn't matter. Property tax relief is needed, and it's needed uh, most by the seniors I hear in my district to help them. And so I call upon the Democratic majority to let us have that opportunity, to let this legislation move out of Rules Committee, and to let the legislation have its day, not only in committee, but so we can get it to the House floor. Thank you. Hi there. Representative Joe Sosnowski. Uh, live in Rockford, represent part of that area, but also Winnebago and Boone County. Uh, as a Republican co-chair on the Property Tax uh, Relief Task Force, uh, I was optimistic that uh, we were going to make some headway, have some spirited debate, and move forward with uh, providing some changes that would provide relief to taxpayers of Illinois. Unfortunately, from the very beginning, uh, the committee was set up uh, really as a sham, uh, and what we see from uh, a report that hasn't even been generated, there simply has been a draft. Uh, it's really a collection of a variety of different thoughts and ideas, none of which have been debated uh, by the full task force, uh, and really they were compiled by, in a draft form again by just a handful of members. Uh, it really does a disservice to property taxpayers uh, in the state of Illinois, especially when we're trying to address what is one of the biggest problems uh, in Illinois and is driving uh, folks and businesses out of the state. Uh, as my colleagues have noted, uh, despite the, the outcry from struggling homeowners, um, we have failed to act, uh, uh, the Democrats have failed to act. We've uh, passed the deadline by uh, quite a long way now and still have not seen anything. I just want to point out a couple other things. It's surprising because the task force was uh, created uh, with the idea that this would help support the Democrats' goal of driving the income tax uh, uh, referendum issue because some of those dollars may provide property tax relief. Well, you think that that would be uh, something that they would want to continue to discuss, but as we've seen, the governor's budget uh, makes absolutely no mention to any property tax relief. In fact, it just uh, proposes driving up additional costs and more spending in state government. 
Um, as I mentioned, the final draft report was just a collection of recommendations, uh, none of which have been discussed at the full committee, none of which have been voted on, and again, this draft uh, remains to be uh, sitting in the background. So instead of bringing us closer to meaningful reform and lasting property tax relief for the families of Illinois, uh, the task force was a complete disaster. Uh, so I'm calling on my Democratic colleagues, uh, as was mentioned by uh, the colleagues here. Uh, we want these bills that we've proposed uh, that were suggested at the property tax uh, committee level, uh, but that we've also, uh, introduced in bill form to have their opportunity to be heard in committee uh, and voted on. Uh, the taxpayers of Illinois deserve this, and we call on the House Democratic leadership to let that happen. Uh, we're now available for any questions. Uh, yes, and Representative uh, Musman has indicated that she does not want me to call that bill because she believes that she has the votes to shut it down. So there's, there again is another instance of this is an area that was discussed at length during the Property Tax Relief Task Force of one of the things that is driving school costs out of control are all of these unfunded mandates that we impose on our schools. So all this bill is doing, it's not even taking issue with the merits of the particular mandates. It's just giving our schools an easier process to get out from under the weight of them. And, you know, she's indicated that she's opposed because she likes mandates. Well, you know, there again, that just goes to show the disrespect that this legislature has for the people who actually have to carry out and implement all of the things that we tell people to do at the local level. This, again, is an area where you need more local control, mo um, you know, more local flexibility, and the Democrats are unwilling to provide it. And what happens? Costs continue to go up. There's got to be Democrats who, you know, like some of the ideas from the bills that you filed. Like, if you let me well, know, tell them to co-sponsor I mean, the bills. Well, no, and that's my question, though. Like, first of all, many Democrats confided in me. Like, the whole task force was ridiculous. Like, it was 80 people. It's insane. But like, why not then? Why why choose to stand up here and say, well, if the Democrats aren't calling our bills. Why not instead go to them and get quiet? Uh, you know, momentum going through the back channels because that's, that's the way that bills pass around here. You're assuming that we haven't. That's the whole point. I've yeah, certainly, certainly for 41, 43, I've had extensive, dis extensive discussions with Representative Musman and with other individuals on that committee who are on the other side of the aisle. And as you can see, none of them have signed on to be a co-sponsor. So this again is one, and you know, and it's very hard for us to be able to count the votes if somebody aren't, isn't willing to even co-sponsor it. What do you think is going to happen in the context of the committee hearing? So that's one of the things where again, it's not as though we're all sitting back twiddling our thumbs, hoping that the Democrats are going to take notice of it. We have been going out and attempting to work these bills and to you know and, and the Democrats are just not taking any initiative on this at all and it's really sad and it's really disappointing because and, the, and by the way there's even some Democrats where their uh, their own members and their own uh, co-chairs didn't even share the draft of the report with them and, you know and, and even the governor's office where's the governor on this he's not taking any leadership role he, he looked my understanding <laughs> is that when he took a look at the the Democrats draft report he basically trashed it and knew that there weren't any good ideas in here that were going to actually bring relief to taxpayers okay what's he going to do with our bills we haven't gotten any um, you know initiative on his end either in the super minority what can you do <laughs> Well, you know, um, one of the things that we can do is obviously we can be here, but what we can do is we can also try to bring, you know, good ideas to the table. And that's the problem, is that can we force a hearing? Can we force a committee to take something up? Can we force Speaker Madigan to look at some of the conflict of interest issues that are inherent in the property tax system? You know, this again is why we need to come to you because the people in our districts are absolutely enraged that nothing is getting done to try to make their lives better. And it's not just in our districts. These are in Democrat districts too. That's the whole reason why it was so important for, Senate, for Representative Yingling to try to make a show that he was going to be a big reformer on property taxes. Where's Representative Yingling on any of these? He's been absent. The bottom line is if you want to lower property taxes, you have to find a different way of funding public schools. And nothing in here well, I disagree with that, actually, because one of the, the, it's not a question of throwing more money at the public schools, but one of the other things is giving the public schools more freedom to find ways for them to control their own costs. Uh, you know, one of the examples that I use is when we were at the College of DuPage, we instituted a whole reform agenda where we were able to cut property taxes, maintain the same level of services, but by doing a whole bunch more creative and innovative things and really looking at certain types of programming we were doing and where we could save money, we were able to save the taxpayers $25 million. So 
again, when you look at the feedback that we're getting from not just our administrators, by the way, but even teachers who are worried about the teacher time that they have to spend on a lot of these mandates, you know, there are ways that these can actually start driving costs down. But the other thing is, is even if you want to say, well, we think these are only going to lower costs by 1%, 5%, 10%, that's a start. And the Democrats aren't even willing to go there. Why not either release a minority report or extend the sunset date on the task force so all that work doesn't go to waste? Well, um, what we did is we actually took our ideas and implemented them into bills. Right. So they're there. They're ready to be, you know, we're, we're happy to pick them up and run with them. We just need to have the Democrats actually agree that this is something that they're going to get on board but with. What about extending the sunset date? So, I mean, to do what? I mean, the, the, whole, the, whole, <laughs> the whole task force wound up being fundamentally dysfunctional in terms of, you know, how things were going to operate. I called on Representative Yingling repeatedly to call the entire task force together before the December 31st deadline so that we could at least discuss some of these issues so that you would have a report to implement, and he refused. So there again, it gets into, you know, th this is, this was, this was, we took the task force seriously. They viewed the task force as a PR stunt, and now we're seeing the consequences of that. In addition, continuing the task force, while we could say we're going to do that, my constituents right now aren't saying, well, let, let's keep working and see. They want action now. And, and filing bills and trying to move the bills forward provides action now. And to the last gentleman's point, as Rep. Mazaki stated, these aren't answers to all property tax problems, but it's a start, and it's a start working on them. And, and we have to address bigger issues for the state in order for the state to step up and start doing its share of funding our school districts. So as soon as we can get working on all that, and we have filed bills to do that, we'll move forward. You talked about mandate relief. What are some of the other kind of uh, big issues that you think uh, Democrats and uh, the legislature need to fully address? So I, the, some of the bills I filed deal with um, if there's a surplus of funds in excess of 150 percent of the levy, it has to be rebated. If, if you have uh, a reserves in excess of 150 percent of your tax levy, that should be rebated to the property taxpayers. Um, I have a bill calling for no further rollovers of bonds. If there's bonds out there and you need another bond, you should have to go to the taxpayers and get approval rather than just rolling it over and keeping the taxes at the same level they are. I have a bill for consolidating school districts into unit uh, districts. So there's a number of them out there. I have more, but there, those are some of, the start, some of the ideas where they can start. We've got um, uh, the governor's proposed budget holds $150 million of the school funding formula reserve. Um, Municipalities were here yesterday and talking about uh, the idea of pulling back 5% of LGDF and even 5% of, I think, like, the tax or something. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they're saying, you know, we need more taxing ability because the state keeps cutting money to local governments. Um, so with that, I mean, is, are these plans for the forthcoming fiscal year uh, hinged upon uh, the progressive income tax, uh, another one of those kind of pressure points that's being created around here? It sure seems to be. And that's unfortunate. I mean, when the state gets back to its priorities of public education, public infrastructure, and public safety as where our priorities should be, we can come, I think we could come together, rank and file, and get something done. But until that happens, and until chair, chairwomen of, of committees uh, have the flexibility and latitude to actually make a decision on their own and stand up and say, let's have a fair hearing, let's see if we can get a yay or nay vote on legislation. And to, to Dave's question, what do you do when you're in the super minority like this? You continue to chisel away at things. You know, raising the white flag and tucking our tail under our coats and going back is not the answer. We have to keep trying. People sent us here to keep trying on their behalf. And that's what all of us and all of our caucus is there. And I, and I believe there are some Democrats, if we could get them to stand up with us, uh, be co-sponsors on legislation, uh, could do it, could do it together. And, and could put some pressure on uh, those that need to have some pressure put on them. But until that happens, uh, it's still continued uphill sledding. This is real just, uh, before you ask that, actually, I just wanted to double uh, back on that. You know, there's no doubt the governor's budget essentially is blackmail of nonprofits, school districts, organizations, state agencies around the state. If you don't pass this income tax, we're going to have all of these cuts. I mean, that's not a way to manage uh, the budget. We have a balanced budget this year. Uh, we can have a balanced budget next year without any additional income tax. Uh, but back to all the points that have been brought up, workers' comp reform, uh, there's numerous versions of pension reform, uh, big and 
and small. There's a lot of big ticket items, small ticket items across the board that can provide relief to local tax, uh, taxing districts, which will then be passed on to property tax owners. This is real off topic, but have any of you been in legislative briefings about coronavirus? Do you feel comfortable um, you know, I have been. back to your district and saying this is our plan? Um, well, you know, it's not exactly clear what the governor's plan really is because the one, uh, the two issues that people in my district really want to get a better sense of is, number one, how great are their risks and threats really? And number two, at what point do they need to start doing things if we do get into what I would call the pandemic type situation, which you're more likely to see if you actually have community transmission as opposed to what we've had right now, where, uh, for example, the first, um, you know, infection case after the first person that was from wife to husband for the third and fourth cases it was the same kind of thing it was a family relationship uh, my understanding is there was a fifth one that was put out now I don't know what the mode of transmission was um, or the suspected mode of transmission was on that one and one of the things that um, that is good news within the coronavirus uh, discussion is that for those first individuals who were infected the quarantine process and the follow-on process and uh, monitoring the hospital workers who were in contact with them um, they are past the 21 day window so there wasn't any actual cross-contamination and cross-infection to any of those individuals so that's a good thing it shows that our our health care system um, for those individuals worked and that the hospitals were careful and we didn't actually get um, you know further community level type contamination one of the things though that um, I think we're seeing not no, not so much here in Illinois just yet but certainly in other states is there does seem to be an increased risk that you're going to start getting community transmission um, because one some of the things that they're finding is that new people who are testing positive for the coronavirus they can't link them back to a known source of um, of possible infection so um, so one of the questions that I continue to ask the governor's office is um, what have you actually done to really look at our stocks and status and inventory and, and have you gotten a handle on um, our personal protective equipment do you, are you um, you know what are your proposed plans if we actually do get to a scenario where it's not just you know one hospital two hospitals three hospitals that might have one or two cases what's the plan going to be if you actually have multiple hospitals that are going to start experiencing an influx of cases in the you know on the the tens or the hundreds type of level um, how do we start to manage those types of scenarios when do you start getting to a point where the number of cases are going to be sufficiently high that you're willing to really actually affirmatively make those proclamations we want to ask people to self quarantine and stay in place for a period of 14 days 21 days to make sure that we're not getting that degree of community spread and and likewise what are you really looking at to make sure we we have a handle on what are the most likely vectors for transmission is it surface to surface is it aerosolized um, you know is it human to human contact to what degree do you need to have that contact before you start getting infected and you know for a lot of these we just don't have the answers yet well, it seems like the four of you came here because you're mad <laughs> and that in 2019 there were some successes and uh, of a bipartisan nature I think most people would agree to that 2020 what about well I mean 2020 is still young so I'm not going to make any predictions on that but maybe I'll let leader Brady take a gander at that one Dave, that, that potential is always there, it's, and, and we're certainly willing. What, what I think all of us in our caucus would tell you is that let's don't wait to the 11th hour. Why do we have to continue to wait to the 11th hour to make something good for the people we all represent? We're ready now. We could be working on a more solitary budget side of things and not wait till the 11th hour, even though we had a, a uh, budget that had no news ta taxes in it that we, we presently, uh, that we passed last year that we're presently in, uh, that came at the 11th hour again. We're saying, let's be proactive instead of reactive. We have the ideas, and we're willing to work with you. Illinois led the nation in outbound migration in the past decade. Uh, some people say it's weather, other people say it's taxes, but Illinois also has the second highest property taxes. Outside of you know the people reading these stories and hearing your guys' plea for action at the state house about property taxes, what should voters and taxpayers do, uh, given that you know people are fleeing the state? Well, I think what we have to do is try and identify the positive things that we've done. Let's look at higher education, where I kind of have my uh, <coughs> fingertips in a little more. And that is when you look at things that we've done when we did in that, that bipartisan budget and that budget that was uh, uh, passed with no new taxes, we looked at what we've done for MAP grants. We looked at what we've done for a 5% increase to our universities. We've looked at trying to stabilize their funding and provide them funding 
that they can rely on and that uh, doesn't pull the fire alarm in, in higher education per se. And when you talk about that and you, and you transform that into so many other areas across the state, it's the message that's delivered from this place, from this capital, to the people that we represent. And that message can't be doom and gloom. The message has to be how do we work together, stop telling us as a majority party uh, the way something has to go and work with us in the minority. We've got some darn good ideas and we're here promoting those good ideas today when it comes to property tax. But how's increasing investment in higher education help that family who's got toddlers and job opportunities in other states and uh, they're looking sure. at forty six hundred dollar property tax bill for a two hundred and five thousand dollar house where in Indiana it's like Sure. Whether it's whether it's higher education, whether it's K through 12, whether it's business, whatever it is, it's showing those people, the very people you're talking about, that there is hope. That these are some of the positive things that can come out of a general assembly when people work together, and we can give you a brighter, optimistic about the future of Illinois. There's lots of good things in Illinois, and everyone in the districts that everybody represents in the state. Let's pull our resources together with that talent and do something on behalf of the people. Sorry, let me, let me, and just, just to follow up on that, you know, one of the other things, too, is it's not as though Republicans are also sitting around not thinking about, are there ways that we can make Illinois a more attractive investment on a long-term basis? And higher education is a perfect example. I have a bill, several of my Republican members have co-sponsored it, that is designed to basically create a pilot program so that we can have an all-in $20,000 cap degree program. Once again, I can't, get the I can't get it out of rules. I can't get the chairman of the higher ed committee to agree that she's willing to actually entertain the idea and have it called for a hearing. So I think if you could tell parents, hey, if you're a resident of Illinois, we have a pathway that we can offer to you where you're not going to have to spend $100,000 on your kids to get them through college. Here's a way that you can only you know, work with $20,000. And by the time you factor in Pell Grants and MAP Grants, there's a way that you can actually bring it down closer to the zero number when you're talking about students who are low income or of limited means that can be a hugely attractive thing for families but again all of these good ideas that we have about ways to try to make our dollars work better for Illinois residents they're not getting a hearing and they're not getting called thank you thanks for watching and if you haven't already please consider subscribing to our channel and while you're at it please leave us a comment thank you for watching